Good morning, everyone. Ooh, the mic's working. That's good. That's good. Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin Wilson, I'm the mayor of the city of Alexander, Virginia. I want to welcome all of you uh, to, uh, to Charles Houston Recreation Center and to our uh, Community Remembrance Project lecture. We are excited to have you here. And uh, there is, uh, I've heard the weather is nice outside. Um, and, uh, and so I know you had a lot of choices by what you could do today, and we appreciate you being with us uh, here. Um, let me begin uh, by uh, recognizing a number of folks who are with us. Uh, first of all, we have our Vice Mayor, Amy Jackson, who's sitting right up here in the front. Um, and we are so honored and privileged to have with us uh, descendants of uh, Joseph McCoy. And so I'd like if you can uh, please rise uh, so we can all recognize you as well. So. One of the uh, great honors has been, uh, of this process has been that we've been able to connect with the de descendants of, uh, of Joseph McCoy and Benjamin Thomas and, and had you, have you along with us um, as a community as we go through this journey. And so um, we, are, uh, we are excited to see you again, some of you again, some of you for the first time, and, uh, and we hope that uh, we will continue to have uh, you alongside us as we continue to, to, uh, to go through this journey, and we want your ideas and your power and your experiences um, as part of this effort. Um, we are gonna begin uh, with a, a moment of silence uh, for, for Joseph McCoy. Uh, 126 years, uh, almost tomorrow, to the date um, of his, uh, his murder by a mob in our community. And uh, we'd like to begin uh, with a moment of silence, if you can. Thank you. So uh, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, uh, which is great. Uh, folks who have been a part of this effort, been to our annual observances that we've been doing uh, for both Benjamin Thomas and Joseph McCoy for uh, a number of years. I see a number of you who uh, went down uh, to Montgomery with us uh, back in October uh, and were part of that, uh, that pilgrimage. Uh, and were able to, to join us down there as part of a, a powerful, uh, as I said down there, um, not the end of this process, but the end of the beginning of this process. And um, it, was, uh, it was an incredible experience to be with so many of you uh, in Alabama and, and go through uh, some of these sites and bring the soil from Alexandria to Alabama but also talk about what um, that collective effort meant uh, to all of us. I think, you know, it, it was obviously powerful to be in those locations, but it was even more powerful to be in those locations with all of you um, and many of you who have been through this journey for a while in this community and had given the power and the ideas and served on committees, um, helped do the research, um, that, was, that made it all the more powerful. But I think what, we, what so many of you said to me both uh, that weekend and then um, afterward as well as prior to that trip, you said, what's next? You know, what, 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 what is next? This, this can't just be a, an annual observance. This can't just be a, a thing where we go and we lay a wreath. Um, that's certainly important and we will continue to do that. Um, but how do we turn this effort, the, the coalescing we have done as a community into something that's far more powerful, far more enduring. How do we take the, the lessons of what uh, occurred, this horrific uh, uh, violence that occurred in our community, that our community was capable of, um, how do we take that and turn it into something that is more transformational for our community? And, and that is part of why we're here today. And, and I'm so excited that we have a, uh, a really incredible speaker uh, lined up for you uh, today. And you're gonna hear in a second uh, about her, her bio and, and what's next in the Community Remembrance Project. But, uh, but I do wanna thank all of you for being a part of this and helping us craft 
uh, what is next. Um, that's not going to come from me. It's not going to come from the city council. It's not going to come uh, from the staff who are staffing this event. That's going to come from all of you. You know, if we are to turn this into an effort that is, is sustainable and is going to help uh, make that kind of transformational change uh, for the future, it's going to come from all of you and, and 10 people that you know who are not here in this room. And so um, that's the work that we have ahead of us. And hopefully um, uh, the, the lecture we're going to hear in a little bit uh, will help us uh, shape that, uh, that future. So I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, at this point, um, I have the privileges of introducing uh, the, uh, the co-chair of the Community Remembrance Project, but also the director of the Office of Historic Alexandria, uh, Gretchen Bulova, who's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, what's ahead, and then uh, she will introduce uh, Audrey Davis, who needs no introduction. So <laughs> Gretchen Bulova, thank you. I think we're still at the good morning part, so thank you so much for being here. It's so great to see you all in person this morning. Um, I'd like to also just uh, welcome and recognize our former mayor, Allison Silberberg, who's joining us today. Thank you, Allison, and our poet laureate, Zaina Azam. Yay. Um, it's great to be here as a community to remember Joseph McCoy and to take next steps in our journey as Alexandria reckons with the grim reality that racial violence and terror are a part of our Alexandria historic narrative. Since the Alexandria Community Project was established, we've partnered with the Equal Justice Initiative's Remembrance Program to research and recognize the history of our city's lynchings. Many of you were in this gym in the fall of 2019 when we heard from EJI's representative, Kira Boone, about the Community Remembrance Project and the EJI, EJI vision for the Community Remembrance Project and Alexandria. And we committed as a community to undertake this effort. Research, markers, public outreach, community meetings, remembrance ceremonies, outreach to descendants. These culminated in a soil collection ritual last September that was followed by an amazing and impactful pilgrimage to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, where we hand delivered the soil jars to honor the lost lives of Joseph McCoy and Benjamin Thomas. With this, Alexandria formally acknowledged the lynchings of Joseph McCoy on April 23rd, 1897, and Benjamin Thomas on August 8th, 1899. And we as a community have apologized for the actions and inactions of our predecessors. But our work is not over. We have talked about that. We committed to that, especially during our pilgrimage to Montgomery. This is just the beginning. And today we gather as a community for the first time really as a, since the pandemic to move forward, to learn about the opportunities to address historic wrongs and to discover how other communities have wrestled with their pasts that's an important part of this as well. I look forward to hearing from our speaker this morning as we consider together Alexandria's future and how we move forward with the Alexandria Community Remembrance Project. So it's my great honor to introduce my longtime colleague and uh, her and to let you know if you haven't heard yet of her new title within the Office of Historic Alexandria. She is Director of Alexandria's African American History Program. So please welcome Audrey Davis. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here, and I'm so excited to introduce our speaker to you. 
at our retreat, our ACR repeat in January, retreat in January, our steering committee spent time learning the different meanings of restorative justice and its use in our court system and in our schools. Our speaker today is going to give us more of a deeper dive into this topic. Our speaker, Mrs. Ms. Wilkerson, has been the managing director at the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center at Howard University since 2021. She is a subject matter expert on racial reconciliation. Since the early 2000s, she has been facilitating trainings and workshops on anti-racism, racial equity, and inclusion. While studying law at Howard University, Ms. Wilkerson served as a research assistant on the seventh edition of the legal textbook, Race, Racism, and American Law, a book essential to the understanding of issues surrounding race in America, as well as how the law is influenced directly and indirectly by race. It was originally written by Derrick Bell in 1973, the man behind critical race theory. But that is a topic for ACR, for, that ACRP will encounter another day. Wilkerson is a 2020 graduate of the Howard University School of Law, and her other accomplishments include drafting the Thurgood Marshall Center's letter to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on Reparations for Afro-Descendants in the United States, and she collaborated to produce an amicus brief to the Supreme Court for the Black Lives Matter protester DeRay McKisson. Ms. Wilkerson is here today to help us understand the concept of justice through the lens of the African American experience, and it's my honor to invite her to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is actually an honor to be here today, and I'm super, super proud of Alexandria for its efforts, particularly in, the, in what's happening in the nation over the past year. So there was a lot that happened a long time ago, and then there was a lot that happened in 2020, and then there was a shift, and you guys represent steadfastness in that atmosphere, and your willingness to go forward is, is really something to be um, acknowledged. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, so everybody calls me Billy. <laughs> My name is Billy Wilkerson, and I am, again, at the Civil Rights Center at Howard, Howard Law School. Um, for the past two years, I've had the opportunity to travel around the country and travel around the world and learn about what's happening in different communities um, as it relates to transitional justice, as it relates to reparative and restorative justice, um, as we work with law students who are struggling with what's the difference between law and justice. And so the conversation that was entitled, What is Justice? is an incre incredibly timely um, conversation. And so I'm hoping to do something that's slightly interactive. I'm hoping that I'm not gonna just talk to you guys. I hope that you guys have real questions. Um, I can tell that each of you has a different background. Some people came to this work through your work and some people came to this work because of what your great-grandparents did and you didn't even know it. Um, and some of us came to this work by happenstance or circumstance and something just happened that drew us to this space. So because I recognize that everybody's in, like each audience that I talk to has a different perspective and brings a different piece to what we're talking about and so you have to unpack it just a little bit and I hope that you guys are ready for that piece of the process with me. So we're going to do a talk. I'm going to talk to you guys first, and then we're going to do a question and answer period. And hopefully during that time, you guys can so jot down your questions for me. Think about what you want to ask, and think about what your vision is for going forward. Because like you were saying, this is the next steps in the process. It's not just laying of a wreath. It's not just a symbolic action. But you guys are engaged as a community about how to deal with this and what happens next. So all of that stuff was not in my planned remarks. <laughs> Let me grab what I was going to try and talk about. Um, so first, I needed to acknowledge Mr. McCoy and his life as a human being and the work that it takes to discover the life of a person when they are a piece of paper on a desk 
right? So um, I went to law school, I'm an attorney. In every area of law and practice, people's lives become reduced to pieces of paper on someone's desk. And whether they're going through a divorce or whether they're going through um, uh, you know, like a car accident and you're going through, like the, the, when the attorney sees it, they don't see the injury as an injury, they see the injury as um, like, okay, well what's the cost associated with that and what are the numbers that are associated with that and how do you deal with this and how do you deal with that? And so they're looking at it in terms of a piece of paper, but when you go and talk to the families and you go and talk to the communities and when you go and talk to the real people, you realize that it's more than just a line in a research project. And someone did the research project, and then someone else took the time to go and find out what to do next. And that's happening all around the country. Um, just last month, I was at, in North Carolina, speaking at the University Studying Slavery. And um, there are, ooh, I don't actually know the numbers of how many, universities, but there are different universities that are taking, taking the time to sit down and, and find out what happened at their university, what was the impact of that. Um, there's a, a young woman named um, Robin Prouty. Robin Prouty is a descendant of the St. Louis University enslaved. And she actually invited me to come and speak with them and the descendants down there. And Robin just created her website, but what happened with her family is that they, were, they reached out to them and um, as part of a research project, they went through line by line and figured out what was going on with, 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 the, with the, the family and then they um, identified all the descendants of her, who had been enslaved by the university and the, and the and the connection between them, and then each of them were able to reconnect and refocus. So I think I just got off on another tangent. Today I'm here to talk about transitional justice, and I'm here to talk about restorative justice, and I'm here to talk about what was before that, which is, um, which is usually called criminal justice, but it's, it's retribution. Retribution justice is the way that we used to think about it, and those things have kind of changed over the last 15 or so years. Um, I'm moved by the fact that a lynching happened and nobody knew about it. And then someone decided to share that story, and now people know. That's important. It's actually extremely, extremely important because there's a, there's a difference. All right, so this was the story I was actually gonna tell. My grandmother is 96. She's from Northern Virginia too. My great-grandmother lived to her 90s and as they become, as they regress, like old people, st old people, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. As people age, <laughs> especially in, as they approach, let's say the hundreds, you know, octogenarians, 90 somethings and the hundred year olds get to this moment in their lives where their 70-year-old children, their 50-year-old children, their, you know, their 30-year-old great-grandchildren are all there. So my grandmother had all of this, they're all visiting this week, so it kind of came up to me. But as they start to go through those moments, the traumas that they experience as children the things that they hid and didn't talk about, the things that were unspoken and unspeakable, came up. It just does. Um, and so my great-grandmother, she was in her later ages, and she was like, she was like, where's daddy? And she kept saying, where's daddy? 
And in modern moments, like right now, there's this broader conversation about fathers and fatherhood. And the piece about where is daddy is sometimes answered in the story of the lynching. It's sometimes answered in the story of mass incarceration. It's sometimes answered in the story of the Jim Crow South or the Jim Crow North. <laughs> like we kind of have this huge separation between what's happening in, in, in one piece of the country versus what's, ha and what's happening in Northern Virginia versus what's happening in Richmond, what's happening over in DC versus what, we're all in this experience though. Like we're all a part of this particular experience and it's, 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 it's all happening. Um, so one other little teeny story that's still a little bit of a sad thing, but um, I was having breakfast with my, with my 70 something year old dad and he was telling a story about his friend whose mom had him when she was 16 and his stepdad raised him, didn't know it was his stepdad and then they divorced and he was gone and he didn't know what happened. But through the research of researchers and through some research on the internet, which didn't exist 50 years ago, and through some connections, he was able to find his 91-year-old father and listen to the story about what happened to him and realize that he was the living example of himself, like him and his father were the same person. And so like that's what's happening over and over again in these descendant communities. Like they're reconnecting to people and they're figuring out that, oh, he didn't just leave for no reason. Like he saw his father lynched and left that community and never came back. You know, like something happened and these stories are being unfolded and, un and retold and examined. And, and when you look it up and you Google it, it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's like, it is, it's a line, it's Joseph McCoy, April 23rd, 1897, and it's so-and-so unknown, such-and-such such unknown, marker here, marker there, this little piece of information, this little piece of information, but then when you start to put the story together and you start to understand the connection and, and that little missing piece is the piece that connects the family member, then this whole concept of epigenetic repair becomes alive. This concept of justice becomes real. This notion of wholeness becomes a possibility in a place in a space where people were once considered three-fifths of a human being. Like, it's this creative moment where something different can happen, different than anything else, but similar patterns is everything else. Like, we're going through the same thing, but it's different this time, and there's so much opportunity for what's happening in this particular moment. So, that being said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about three kinds of justice. Old-fashioned criminal justice, which is retribution or retributive justice. New school justice, when I was younger, which is restorative justice. And then this notion of transitional justice. So, oh, do I have, I probably don't. So old school res, res, re, 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 retributive justice is like um, the state is the governing actor. And when you do something criminal, you do that criminal activity against the state. So, I don't know, you guys have probably never been arrested or gone to jail for criminal activity. So, <laughs> what happens is the, the, the state is the one that, so the state would be, in a regular example, it would be um, the police department and the city of Alexandria. So like, um, 
get, we're not going to use that story. So, <laughs> so they they and so in a traditional way, what would happen is the state gets represented, the person gets, and you look at it from a from a like a state perspective. What happens in restorative justice is that you look at it as a person person basis, like a person was harmed, and that person was harmed by a person, not necessarily the state. Like, the way that you approach it is a more human kind of perspective. But then in um, transitional justice, it's actually historically been with, um, like, governmental entities. All right, so let me rewind a little bit more, because actually I should have done an actual sit-down retreat with you guys so that we could like break down each piece and explain it because like I said I can tell that you guys are in different places and that each of the pieces of information that I'm saying was making sense to some people and then other people are like huh what's that um, so I can kind of I'm picking that up but um, the background about transitional justice is that it used to be applied primarily in international spaces. So like an international human rights framework um, prescribes that when something goes wrong in a community, in a country, in a place, that something should be done and like it, it, um, for the sake of humanity, something better should exist. And so they've taken the time to have like the Declaration of Human Rights and they've taken the time to go over what should happen in any community for any human being when, like just period, like human beings should be able to eat. Human beings should be able to drink water. Human beings should be able to not be in, in extreme poverty. Like, it was just human rights, right? So in transitional justice, the model used to be that the United States is um, the United States is, is a great country, which it is, and there the United States is a first world country, and um, it doesn't have the same problems as other countries. And so, people who did international human rights um, or people who did transitional justice work had traditionally worked in. Um, what they call autocracies, or like governments that have dictators. And in those dictatorships, once the dictator was, uh, would leave and a democracy was installed, they would have a transitional justice team come in, right? Like that's kind of um, the background behind how transitional justice evolved. So at the United Nations, for at least 70 years now, there have been black activists who've been going and saying, um, United Nations, while we agree with your notions of human rights and human like experience, we want you to acknowledge that there is a different experience for black Americans in this country. And so in 1950, one, 1950, I have to double, <laughs> sorry. So what, what, what happened was um, W.B. Du Bois, um, W.B. Du Bois, uh, sorry. What, so what happened back then is that there was a group of black activists who went and spoke to the United Nations and um, what during that period of time, um, the, um, military, there were, there were black soldiers that were serving in World War, who had served in World War II, who were coming back from their service overseas, and after their service overseas, they were like raising the difference between what they were seeing in the ghettos in the United States versus what they were seeing in the ghettos in other places. And as they were doing that work, and as they were having those conversations, then um, organizations like the NAACP, which was just starting to form, and like those kinds of things were like starting to talk about what the problems were in those places and spaces. And so what they said 
is that they needed to have a, a separate representation or an additional representation for what's happening in the black communities going across the United States because it's not the same story that they were telling about what's happening in the United Nations generally. So fast forward 70 years, 60 something years, um, there was uh, a, a huge shift in the conversation about what was happening in the United States. So um, Mike Brown was killed um, by the police and, um, and uh, several young black men, women, people were being um, killed by the police in a way that the media was treating differently than it had before 2015. And so like there was a shift that started to happen in the conversation and there was a moment where people started to say this needs to happen differently and um, there was a report that was done where Mike Brown's family went to Geneva, Switzerland. And in that trip to Geneva, Switzerland, which is where the United Nations has its meetings and they have several different like sub-organizations that are organized to be able to explain um, what's happening in different situations and how to improve them all over the world. But Mike Brown's family was able to present to um, the United Nations and talk about police violence in the United States, talk about racial disparity in the United States, and why there's a difference between the conversation here and the conversation that you've been having before. So that was like, I'd have to double check, but that's like 2016, 2017. Then later on, there was something called the, um, I think that those, those mechanisms led to the creation of something called the Permanent Forum for People of African Descent. And so there's a global movement for people from all over the country and all over the world to um, talk about that. And so there's a difference. All that's to say that the way that transitional justice used to be, which was those countries in those places and spaces got changed to transitional justice being able to be applied to a United States way of looking at it. So um, things like lynchings are now being examined from a transitional justice lens. Things like mass incarceration are being examined from a transitional justice lens. Things like um, slavery are being examined from a transitional justice lens. And then what happens later on in those places and spaces so that the person who was like, who lost the person who had been lynched can re redress that, that thing. So the, the term that when, so when you reach out to the family member and you say, um, we acknowledge that this happened and we want for this type of thing to never happen again here, that's satisfaction and that's a promise of non-repetition under the UN framework. Okay, so that's all to give you guys just a little bit of background. I really did super, super, super condense a lot of pieces of information in that and I, I I, I did struggle a little bit in trying to put together um, something that was coherent and cohesive enough to be able to put the pieces together between what's happening with the lynchings, what's happening internationally, and what's happening in terms of, of all the different ways that justice can be perceived. But um, what I wanted to do, instead of going through a very, very like boring <laughs> kind of like uh, refined kind of bullet by bullet explanation. I wanted to just introduce the general concepts, see where you guys were in the room, and then have an, a, a little bit more of a conversation about, about those things. Um, and the main point that if I don't get to anything else in this conversation is that the work that's being done here is good. The work that's being done here is important. And it's completely worth it because as you start to compile all of the different things that are happening in different places, 
it adds to that conversation. And because of the moment that we're in, in terms of, um, in terms of internet and artificial intelligence, then the conversations that were impossible to have before are very easy to have now because people have more access to information and you can organize m massive amounts of inf information and make them relevant to individual people in a way that couldn't happen in the past. And so I just wanted to say thank you all for all that you're doing and keep showing up. Keep being a part of the conversation. Keep engaging in this work and keep doing the repair work that needs to happen in order for, for this, this world to be a better place. That's it. Okay. So, now I'd like to engage much, much more interactively. Matter of fact, I didn't tell you guys about this before, but I would like for you guys to come up. Is that okay? Yeah, pretty please. So one of the things that we know is important is engaging descendant communities in those conversations and not speaking for them, but giving them their own voice and saying some of the things that they know are important so that you're incorporating that. And then in addition to that, thank you. Y'all doing good. No, you're doing really good. Okay, so in addition to that, I wanted to get a sense of some of the people in the room and what organizations you guys represent. Um, and so whoever's just not shy and feels comfortable with talking, could you just raise your hand and say who you are, who you represent, and if you've got a whole crew here today, to be able to say, this is my crew, I'm with so-and-so. All right, so I'm gonna call on you first, Mayor. <laughs> Um, I'm Justin Wilson, the mayor of the city of Alexandria, Virginia. I represent the uh, Hunters of Scotland Hill District. And how does that work? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How does, how, does it, how does it engage with this in this process, and what made you guys like begin to do this work? Um, well, I think, I think we had started this effort, as Ms. Gretchen talked about earlier, uh, a number of years ago, and I think we've been uh, 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 doing the research Okay, excellent. I'm gonna to point to the next person. So we're gonna make an effort to use the mic so that everybody can hear better. Everybody can hear Matt. That's funny, because uh, usually when you get a mic, you got a politician, a musician, or a fool. So, <laughs> and I've been all of them in my lifetime, except for the politician. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mac Arthur Myers. I'm a resident uh, of Alexandria, and I represent the Masonic Order, Miss um, Billy. Universal Lodge Number One is the oldest Prince Hall Masonic Lodge in the state of Virginia. February 5th, 1845, Alexandria, Virginia. As a human being, being done to another human being, the incident with Joseph McCoy, as a human being, in the book of Deuteronomy, it's about justice, God's law. If you're not at the table, you're not participating, in my opinion, as small as that is. So I desire to sit at the table, be proactive, interactive with the energy and the spirit of the universe, because you gotta pay your rent on this earth. And I'm, as I see myself, I'm just gliding through. So I join organizations that is compatible with my spiritual energy. 
Then when I heard about Joseph McCoy, then I see my childhood friend over there that we went to school together, Robert. I said, dang, that's that small universe again. Mm -hmm. That's that small universe again. So when the research went out and it was asked, do anybody know Robert Taylor? I said, I know, I know Robert Taylor, preacher. <laughs> so it's good to be involved because it's connected. Connected in Alexandria because this is our home. We went to, from childhood to now, look at us, old. <laughs> I ain't say O-L-D, I just say O. Oh, me, oh, my, I just have age. <laughs> no, but anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mac. Thank you, Mac. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm a, we are descendants of, of Joseph McCoy, as you know. Um, what this means for us and what it means, when I say us, not just the family, I'm talking about the community, you know. We got Alexandria, we got Virginia, we got the United States, we got global communities. But what it does, it brings us uh, together. People might say, well, it's divisive, you know, because what happened was such a terrible thing and it was targeted towards a man primarily because of his ethnicity. And, but it brings us together because it puts us on the same plane of acknowledging what happened and agreeing that this was an egregious crime that took place. That is the beginning of the community that can develop, even among our family and, and, and among this community. That, that is a beginning. There were people that, when I came here this weekend, that I remember from last year when we came, community. And we have something to build upon. So it's important for us to remember and to acknowledge what happened so we can learn from it, we can grow from it, we can impact our families that are related to us um, through genealogy as well as people who, who are just in our same community. It's, it's very important. And there are people within our family, within Alexandria, within Virginia, within the United States, that think it's not important. But it's quite the opposite. It's very important. It helps us to grow and to become better people who can work together, live together, and we can play together. That's why it's important. Is it yeah. My name is Sandra Ingram. I'm from Miami, Florida. I met Cindy, and um, over the years, we talk about history, ancient history, recent history, and we are part of history. I live over in Fort Washington, Maryland. So I come over, I walk across the bridge, I walk under the bridge, I walk through Old Town, I see the mile markers, I see the posters, and I may not have really recognized Joseph McCoy. It may have just been a sign. Um, I, of course, there's Alfred Street Baptist Church, which is so great, but um, sometimes, even in the civil rights movement, I don't always know where I fit. Sometimes talking about the Civil War is a different conversation for me versus other people's history. I'm also a veteran, naval veteran, so the um, Civil War Memorial there in Alexandria, it's, it's just rich in history. But today I'm part of a narrative and the thing that you talked about with the uh, people when they get older 
especially as they're approaching death, because I've sat with a lot of people at that place of hospice, and the stories come out, the traumas come out, um, and, and a lot of times it seems that just before they cross over, they look and the families come, and they see, and there is a joy there, and so today I am overjoyed by everything that I've experienced here and definitely seeing the different cultures because we are connected. We are connected and that we are not willing to erase what has happened and 126 years is a lot for our nation to be so young, but for our, our traumas to be so great. But I do feel today is also a day of healing. So there is a hole in my soul that is being healed as I stand and speak to you. So thank you, and thank you. My name is Blair Forlaw, and I was a member of the research committee for this effort. And, um, but what really has piqued my attention this morning is I'm also the mother of a daughter who works for the UN in Geneva. And so you start talking about global connections, and I've never heard of the permanent forum for people of African descent. I'm, I guess I can go home and Google that. But I would really be interested in hearing more about that. And also, to ask um, you the question, how would we relate this efforts like this through the UN and to what we might understand as truth and reconciliation commissions? And how, if at all, would you describe what we're doing here as a kind of truth and reconciliation process? And is that at the heart of what transformational justice is? So I'm using my time as an excuse to ask a question. <laughs> okay. So that, that was actually the first actual question question. Uh, and so I'm going to address it just by giving you some more ma material. So um, there's an organization that is a partnership between Howard University and Columbia University in a brilliant professor by the name of um, Linda Mann, and uh, who worked on Georgetown G72 and a bunch of other things, um, and Justin Hansford uh, collaborated to create the African American Redress Network. And in the African American Redress Network, there are, there's a map of different activities that in the absence of the bigger picture, you wouldn't realize that it connects to the bigger picture. It's like communities see something and they say something and they do something about it, but they don't realize that the echo of what they're seeing and saying and doing something about is part of a bigger movement. And so that's what you guys are. You're actually part of a bigger movement and it's happening, period. <laughs> But the redress map will help you to see the bigger movement. It, it um, tracks about 450 or so um, reparative justice efforts. So like EJI is doing the lynching project, but it is more broad in, in how it approaches like uh, things like um, the Jesuits and the 100 uh, million dollars that they raised to be able to redress the harms from the people who they actually enslaved you know, projects like that, that are all over the country, and then uh, fitting the work that's being done in smaller communities about specific things that specifically harm specific people and redressing those things as part of the bigger picture. So that's the first thing that I wanted to address. The second thing is the permanent form for people of African descent. It's new. Um, it is not in the absence of everything else, 
slightly longer conversation, but I actually was able to attend its very first session with 13 Howard University law students, and they did what they called um, city reports. There's something called the, the Black Audit Project that's happening in different cities around the country, and um, they're doing racial disparity reports to the United Nations about what is happening in individual cities. So uh, as we speak, I don't have the calendar in front of me. This week, there were, they were doing a city project in Cleveland. Um, they were doing a city project in, I think last night it was Chicago. Um, and they, they presented on 13 cities at the United Nations. And then this, this semester, the students are doing another project to report on what's happening in each of those cities. Separately, um, at the, the law clinic, uh, no, not at the clinic, at, at the, in the international uh, criminal law and transitional course, um, the students under the leadership of Professor Darren Johnson did a transitional justice report, and they are um, they're finalizing that for the semester. But it's it's very much um, emergent and emerging, and um, that's the reason why having this talk and this conversation is so important and so timely. And so, if folks want to talk about how to engage that and go deeper, I. Um, I edited what I had to say today so that I wouldn't say too much that was over certain like people's heads. Different people are in different places. So if somebody who does want to have those follow-up conversations, then we're interested in, and available to continue to have a much more kind of um, in-depth conversation about, about those things. But I also have these folks in, in here to be able to answer some of your questions as well. I think I have gone over the time that I said I was going to do, but she said that we can go longer if we needed to. Hi. Uh, my name is Lonnie Rich. Um, I've lived here in the city for about 50 years. And I was kind of taken aback when you, when you invited us to, to, to indicate who we represented. And I thought, I, I don't really represent anybody. But, the, but then I realized I do represent somebody. My family on my mother's side. My mother was a Holt. My family has been here for 500 years. We were here from 1620. And I'm very proud of my family. I love my family. But my family's big. It, it's a big family. And, but it's big in, in lots of respects. Uh, it's, it's not just my own blood family, but, but the, the lar larger family. And, and Mac was talking about this being a small world. It is a small world, and it's getting smaller all the time. And I think one of the things that's important for us to do as individuals is finding out about our family. The, the McCoy family has found out stuff about their family that's, that's tragic, and, but it's also been, there's something good has come out of, out of finding out the horror of, of 1897. I have the same stuff in my family. For 200 years, my family, my family owned slaves. Um, and because I know pretty much, I don't think Thomas Jefferson was the first uh, person to have, have an affair with, with a slave. I think many of them did, which in all likelihood means that I have African American relatives that I don't know yet. I am on a quest. And I guess my, the thing that I would say mostly to the white people here is that, and, and elsewhere, is it could help our country a lot if you would just search your family and figure out the story of your family. And every family's got bad in it and every family's got good in it. I, I've got lots of stuff in my family that I'm very proud of. I've got things that I'm, that I'm embarrassed about and I wish it never happened, but they did. It's just part of that, it's part of history. And what I can do is, I, I would love to find all of my family. And I'm searching. Uh, and, and I think it would help everybody if, if and, 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 and sort of, it, this ties into the whole subject of our history. It is our history. And learning about our history is learning about all the parts of our history. It's not learning about, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the old South and how it, how it was in the glory days. It's learning about everybody's history who lived in the South. 
and it's and the same in the north and there's good and bad up there and and it's uh i just think it's really important that that people um learn about their own personal history and uh, and and see how it applies in a in a broader sense thank you, thank you. so i do want to comment on that because you are so incredibly right, and it's so incredibly brave. And people talk about brave spaces and speaking up and, and being able to acknowledge your family and acknowledge their history. There's a brilliant and beautiful human named Lottie Dula, who has an organization called Reparations for Slavery. And her organization, um, is one of the is is one of the organizations that helps white people uh, feel more comfortable about these conversations and understand things that they're just like well, wait why or how or you know so she was a uh, I think she's a financial analyst and um, it got passed down to her from her aunt. I believe that she was now going to be the family archivist. So she went upstairs to an attic or something. I'm probably not telling the story perfectly, but she went upstairs to an attic and she started to put together her family history and she started to like, she saw all these beautiful little pieces and all these sweet little stories and she learned about her grandmother and her great grandmother and she learned about all these people and then in that process, she, and she was a person who grew up in the Midwest who felt completely detached from anything related to slavery and um, realized that her family's wealth had come from the slave trade. And in, in that, she found the names of the people who her family had enslaved. And so she started a process of reaching out to those people. And she started an organization where she has this back and forth communication and she started educating other white people about how to do that process and what it looks like to open up some closets and blow some dust off of some stuff and how much repair work can come out of those conversations and how much good can happen in this broader conversation where information is available and genealogy lines are connecting people and things that didn't used to be possible are possible. So it's beautiful. And I wanted to give you that resource. There's a couple of other resources. There's RAZAR, which I don't know the acronyms for right this second. But there's something called the Virginia Coalition um, that supports these, dis like, supports descended <laughs> communities and supports um, these efforts, and so it's an uh, intentionally inclusive mixed community that talks about what's happening in Virginia and how to be a part of that. So if anybody's interested in joining the Virginia Coalition or learning more about that, it's also on the African American Redresses Network's website, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's a great uh, resource if you're just like, that's interesting and cool, glad you know 500 years of your history, but I just know who my grandmother is. Um, but if you're in that place and space, it gives you something to be able to like start from. It's actually a really, really beautiful process. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. One more. Hi, I'm Kareen Baker. I'm a member of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church here in Alexandria. Um, we have been on a, on a journey for some years now to, uh, to acknowledge the uh, racism and the, the violence of the white church, um, the Lutheran church, and, and what it means for today. Um, and I'll just I'll speak just a little bit from my own experience, um, and and actually kind of what you were just saying made me think of this. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, small uh, small rural town, mostly white. Um, in fact, well, all white. Um, and race was never a conversation in in my family, which, as I grew up, I took to mean that you know, we're all equal, and I took it as a positive. Um, but growing up and, and becoming an adult and, and moving out here and having different experiences, I learned actually that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, 
it, it wasn't talked about because, I don't know, because it wasn't our experience, because I found out it, it, it didn't necessarily mean that people believed in equity and, and equality, um, and that the status quo was just fine, and it's not. And so, for my own personal experience, um, and, I, and I think, um, you know, on behalf of my church, we're trying to, to move into these spaces and learn different experiences and connect our own to them so that we can build, build relationships, so that we can um, attempt to repair harms, so that we can look at how historical actions, inactions impact the present and, and how we can move forward. I, I like the, the, just the sentiment raised by transformational justice, um, how we can transform the way we live in this country as, as a people of beautiful diversity. So. So I'm gonna, so I, I wanna make sure that you guys all know that I'm very, very accessible and that the work that is being done is very, very accessible if you're interested in furthering it. It's accessible for municipalities who are organizing. It's accessible for community members who just want to learn more. It's accessible for descendant communities that want to be connected to other descendant communities and see what's happening and see like, oh, you guys are over here. Maybe we can do some of those things too. Um, family reunions is coming a bigger thing. Pre 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 past COVID, pre post COVID, <laughs> um, and um, and in terms of one of the things that was just raised with the, the churches, there's a lovely organization in Washington D.C. called the Festival Center. It's part of the Church of the Savior, um, which were historically part of the, the Church of the Savior, and they've been doing some really, really amazing work having conversations for a very long time, but recently specifically around um, reparations and what can be done and what churches can do, and just even learning all the beautiful things that have already happened is kind of special. So that's another um, piece of information and opportunity, but I wanted to give you a chance to say a couple of words, and then we're going to have the... Closing remarks from Jeff Gretchen. Thank you. My name is Robert Taylor, and my being here is crucial to the fact that when we think about the word community, there's no word community without the word communication. And injustice has been so prevalent because we haven't been communicating. We've been hiding, we've been, um, Young people would say perpetuating a fraud rather than getting to know one another. And this is an effort on that level which will result in commu community because we are communicating. When we look at injustice in America and all that's been shared, one of the keys has been the lack of communication. And there's a thing I used to say many years ago, I don't say it now, but to know me is to love me. In other words, if you get to know each other, we could do better. We, we, thank you so much. I was gonna say, can I get an amen, but a, a round of applause wouldn't hurt, amen. If we would just simply put forth the effort. I mean, the, the last speaker talked about what's going on in the church, and a lot of times you don't hear this, and a lot of times a lot of people don't believe or think that there's racism because if you don't experience it, it doesn't exist. If, you, you're, if you're not on the receiving end, just imagine, I won't be long, then we'll take up our offering. I won't be long. <laughs> but just imagine never having the conversation. You, you're Caucasian. You never have the conversation with your children about if you go in the store, keep your hands in your pocket. You never have that conversation. That, that doesn't even enter into your thinking. What a marvelous country, what a marvelous world that would be if everyone had that privilege of not having to explain to your children if you're driving your car and you're ever pulled over the police, you have to act a certain way. 
It's com community is based on communication. So what has been said, we need to just keep this up. As we get to know each other and see what each and every person is doing, something that fits in the big picture, it can only result in us loving and respecting one another more. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Billy. Thank you to the family of Joseph McCoy. I know that was probably a little unexpected to, to be up here. It is an honor for us that you are here and to share in this. I just, I can't tell you how much it means to us that you've taken time, traveled from afar, locally as well, um, to be here today. It means just a tremendous amount. You know, one of the things I was supposed to say is if you aren't already a member of the Community Remembrance Project, please sign up on our website. But I'm not sure there's anybody here who's not already part of our ACRP family. So many of you have given for the last, you know, three years on the Soil and Marker Committee, the Pilgrimage Committee, the Research Committee. Um, outreach, fundraising, uh, you've just been so involved and especially the members of our steering committee. So I just want to thank you for keeping this idea, this movement alive and moving us forward. Uh, tomorrow uh, we will do a remembrance walk. Uh, I invite you to join your fellow community members at 145 on the Fairfax side of Market Square. And we will have some opening remarks, and then we will pr process as a community to the lynching location. Uh, so the event really is 2 o'clock. You'll see that on our uh, materials that we have circulated, but we would, we would like to start at 2 o'clock. So if you could join us earlier, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, we also are very excited that on May 20th, uh, we will have the kind of the results, the awards for the members of, um, for those who have received a, no, I'm saying this all wrong. It's the EJI Essay Contest winners. The awards will be presented to those students from Alexandria High School who, uh, who have won. And we have been talking about this essay contest for a long time. Uh, it went live on Martin Luther King Day and closed in March. We had a number of amazing applications. These students are incredible people with bright futures and it has that many of them have been involved with us have participated on the pilgrimage and I'm, I'm just so proud you know to have um, them be our partners and the, the, the teachers that work with them are extraordinary uh, so please join us on May 20th in City Council Chambers um, at 11 a.m. and we will send that out again in an email so thank you for joining us today. Oh, well, so a couple of next steps, right? We, um, the city has, uh, has given us uh, funding for a documentary for our project to really, to document the uh, story of Joseph McCoy and Benjamin Thomas. And so the bids have gone out and they have come in and we're about to award the vendor, I'll just call it that. <laughs> I sound a little bureaucratic. Um, so that we will be starting to write and uh, record and hopefully less than a year from now we'll have a, a video uh, debut of, of that documentary. Oh. Mac, just come up here. <laughs> I'm not a Mac mind reader. Well, and, and also for next steps, um, so fr this coming Friday is the final workshop um, that is being run. And it's at the, the Lyceum, so if you've been participating in that, um, thank you. I've heard amazing feedback, so we'll do the final session with the closing dinner. 
And then we will have our next community remembrance project meeting. We'll get that information out to you to do a community conversation on next steps. Um, I think having some information on restorative, um, reparative justice, uh, transitional justice um, is the is the kind of the start of that, so that we can see where that takes us and where our programming, our outreach, uh, where we grow. And of course, please mark your calendar now for um, a ceremony for Benjamin Thomas on August eighth. Now we're going to let Mac tell you all about. Come on. Hey, um, y'all remember when I said a fool, a politician, or a musician? <laughs> That's the musician part. No, but seriously, as a citizen resident of Alexandria, I've never been so proud of our students that went along on the pilgrimage and the sojourn down to Montgomery, Alabama. They carried themselves with dignity. They were focused. And as a result of that focus, they just recently received the Virginia Education Award for the documentary that they took of the trip and the pilgrimage that they received that award is, in my mind, said it's, a, it's on an Emmy, Emmy level, age-appropriate Emmy level. So um, pick up the zebra, page 16, you'll see the story. Thank you. So with that, I, I invite you to stay and visit with your friends um, and to have a fantastic weekend, and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.